Chiefs, and, and some of whom are doing double duty in this segment here, include the Admiral <laughs> Bill Stubblefield. Billy. Well, with John being both guest and co host, that means I can just sit back and just watch. <laughs> As will I. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Del- former delegate John Doyle. John, good morning again. Well, good morning, but if you sit back and watch, Rob, you, you better pay attention to that board there. <laughs> yes, I will, sir. Uh, before we continue along, uh, Cheryl uh, Kump just uh, followed up with another text to me as an example of what uh, the situation is with foster care. And, uh, it, I'll just read it to you. I just had three children that I tried finding a family to take, and a social worker told me they can't get foster families, and the children are being put in hotels. Thank goodness I found a family member, the mother, who is a friend, turned to drugs and abandoned her boys for two days. I received a call asking for help. I had the boys with us until I found the family member. This is absolutely factual. So we haven't heard much about the foster care situation in the state in quite some time in terms of uh, public discussion about the issues and concerns. So... Did that mean that it was going well, or we just got tired of talking about it? Well, apparently we must have just gotten tired of talking about it. Yeah, it it has not been fixed. Lane Dill gave us a very good insight several months ago. Perhaps we get Lane back on to see what what, what the status is right now. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, the latest... From Cheryl on that one. I appreciate the input. Now, uh, Mr. Doyle is in studio as a co-host and as a guest (laughs) in this segment. And uh, while we're having some fun with that fact, the fact of the matter is the play you're doing is about a very serious subject. Very serious. Uh, Every so often, uh, a group gets together and puts on a play uh, in the courthouse in Charlestown. Uh, The play is called The Anvil, uh, and it's about the trial of John Brown. Uh, And and much of the play itself is is the trial. There are are scenes that are, uh, a few scenes that are aside from that, where you have private conversations, but most of it takes place uh, in in the courtroom. Uh, And it's that we have it in the courthouse in in what is now the courtroom uh the original courtroom in which brown was tried in charlestown was on the ground floor it o- occupied the whole width of the courthouse the the interior was burned during the civil war and when they rebuilt the interior of the courthouse they put the courtroom on the second floor and offices on the bottom floor the courtroom is the courtroom in which bill blizzard was tried uh, who was the miners general in the the battle of blair mountain in the 19 19- 20s uh and uh, so this is the only courthouse in america that has hosted two treason trials uh That's the trial amazing fact yeah the trial of john brown in uh, 1859 and then the trial of bill blizzard in the 20s the play was written by julia davis and the, the, the term anvil is that sometimes God comes up with a piece of steel up, up, upon which uh, his truth is beaten. Uh, and uh, the, the, you, you, the idea is to, you know, to this day, uh, John Brown is debated. Uh, you know, was he a, a terrorist or was he a hero? And not not that they are necessarily mutually exclusive. Uh, and so the uh, 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 I'm looking forward to it. The last time we did it was in 2014. Uh, I was in it in 2014, and the year before 2013. We haven't done it uh, for nine years now, so we're hoping that uh, the absence will uh, will cause some interest. It's produced and directed by a fellow named Joe Yates, who we've had Joe on the program before, yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, he uh, does a lot of of play acting and directing and producing uh, at the old Opera House and other places around here. So he knows what the heck he's doing, mm-hmm. and he also plays John Brown. So he is the producer, director, and lead actor uh, in the uh, in the play. And who do you play, John? I play a fellow named Phelps, who is a jerk. Uh, and <laughs> well, that's not fitting at all. <laughs> that cast for you, John. <laughs> I don't. I don't like how you're being pigeonholed here. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, it's interesting. Uh, uh, he is the conductor of the train that Brown and his men stopped when it came through about the time of the raid, and. All this guy Phelps cares about is that Brown stopped his train. 
He doesn't care about slavery, freedom, any of that stuff. It's all me, me, me. Why did you do this to me? Uh, it's my train that you stopped. Why did you stop my train? Uh, and it's interesting. I played him in 13 and 14 rather comically because I wanted the audience to like this character. I'm doing him differently this time. My goal is for people to not like this character uh, when when the play is over. So at any rate, uh, that that's my role. Uh, and uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. the, the author. Julia Davis, her father was a fellow named John W. Davis, John Wilson Davis, a Democratic nominee for president in 1924, the only West Virginian ever nominated for president by a major party. He was nominated in the infamous 103 ballot convention in Baltimore that took several days. Uh, back then, the, the, you had to have a two-thirds majority to get nominated, and they did away with that rule after that convention. So anyway, he was the – and he had a reputation of being probably the, the premier trial lawyer – of the first half of the 20th century. Uh, in his 20s, in the early part of the, of, of, of the 20th century, he was the attorney of record for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People of West Virginia. He argued a number of civil rights cases uh, for the West Virginia NAACP. Uh, later on, uh, he moved away from that, started taking cases that paid him a whole lot of money, and became a very wealthy person, uh, and again, a very successful trial lawyer. Um, and in the 1950s, to the consternation of his daughter, he became the attorney for South Carolina in the Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka was actually a consolidation of a number of cases about school segregation. And he argued in favor of school segregation uh, for South Carolina. Uh, and uh, after it was over, at, at the same time, he was in his 80s, he was also the attorney of record for J. Robert Oppenheimer when the Defense Department was attempting to uh, to deny him a security clearance. In his 80s, he was handling both of these cases at the same time. Uh, so the, and about 20, 25 years ago, there was a TV miniseries about this, and Burt Lancaster played John W. Davis. I can't remember who the actor was that played the person uh, on the opposite side of Brown versus Board, which was Thurgood Marshall. Who who uh, who later became uh, was appointed to the Supreme Court by Lyndon Johnson. Anyway, there is some speculation that one of the reasons Julia Davis wrote this play was in somewhat repentance for her father's participation as the attorney for South Carolina in those segregation decisions. So, uh, or in the in the in Brown versus Board, there's a whole lot of history here, and and, and if you if you Hey, when you see the play, you will see there's a whole lot in the discussion that applies today. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to give away the story, sure. but much of what is being debated uh, applies today. So, yeah. questions. <laughs> I'm going to refer the first question to my fellow co-host to ask the guest a question. Who me? Yes. <laughs> no, no, seriously, John. Go, go, go. All right. All right. Now, why, am I, why am I in this play? Well, why am I in this? I'm in this play because I love doing it. Hey, um, could, in all seriousness, though, I, I think most people have at least a, a little bit of a knowledge of John Brown, and uh, maybe at least the superficial level. Can you give us a little bit more detail? on his mindset and his decision-making and, and ultimately what happened? Well, he was clearly a driven person. And while he contended he didn't want to kill people, he did kill people. Uh, it's uh, uh, the... the uh, uh, I've, I've seen three or four different people play John Brown 
uh, in, 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 in different productions of the Anvil over the years. It actually was produced in New York off Broadway in 1968. Uh, and then, uh, it, b- 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 it, right after that, its first production was in the, uh, uh, was in the courthouse in Charlestown. A guy named Robert Leonard played Brown and he was about six feet four with a deep booming voice. Uh, and a- actually, uh, uh, you don't have to do that, by the way, John, you already have a deep booming voice. Okay. Okay, well, whatever. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, and I've seen different people playing since then. And actually, I am told that he, he, did, he wasn't that physically imposing a person. Sometimes you, if you look at, at photos taken, he maybe looks that way. But, but he actually was kind of slender. Uh, and, and he had kind of a squeaky voice is what I am told. I, I of course, I'm not that old. I, I never heard the guy talk. But uh, uh, at any rate, um, you can do him in many different ways. I mean, it's, it's uh, um, what, what, what did he mean? And, and that's really what Julia Davis's play uh, certainly asks and probably does not answer is exactly just what did make this guy tick. John, you mentioned your, the role you're playing uh, for the conductor, and the first two times you played it, you had a comical spin. Yeah. This time you're going to have a more negative spin because mm-hmm. you view it as me, 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 me. How does this me, 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 me attitude differ from what we see in society today? Well, uh, I don't. It, it doesn't. But I still did it as a me, me, me uh, the first time. That that's the way the the uh, author wrote it. And much of the dialogue actually comes from the trial. Uh, many of the characters you see, when, for example, the attorney will ask a question, and 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 many of the characters are people who are on the witness stand. There, the statements that they make in response to the questions are the statements that were actually made in the trial. So this is this is a good bit of real history that obviously it's it's dramatized. Uh, I just decided before that I wanted him to be you know kind of a kind of not very serious person. Yeah. Now I, I decided let me see if I can make him a serious person and uh, and with the with the same dialogue the same lines exactly the same lines it's just the uh, what kind of emotion you convey when you state those lines uh, let's go back to the uh, gentleman john davis who who i am not aware of at all uh-huh. but i but i find him intriguing uh the background that you mentioned would lend himself to the scope trial did he have any role whatsoever with william jennings Bryan and charles Burrow? no okay. no uh davis was a good bit younger than than brian uh brian was uh probably in his what 50s or 60s when okay. the scopes trial came yeah. around and davis was still a very young lawyer then in clarksburg again uh making his reputation by winning cases for the naacp yeah the the viewpoint on john brown is it as simple as whether you're north or south of the mason dixon line as to how you view john brown i don't think so um it, it's uh, uh now obviously if if you are of a of a mindset that what we call the Civil War was the war of northern aggression, and I talked to a number of people who use that term, many of them jokingly, but I suspect that some of them actually believe that, they're not definitely not going to like John Brown. Uh, if you are from a family whose whose ancestors were slaves who were freed by the Civil War then there's a very good chance that you're going to consider John Brown a hero. Uh, The question is whether someone is a terrorist or a hero. Uh, Probably ultimately is, do you think that violence was the only way that the slaves were ever going to be freed? Uh, There are some people who think that if, if we had waited it out another 20 years, you know, we had we had the compromise, the, the Missouri Compromise in 1820 that Henry Clay had engineered, lasted for about 30 years. Then you had the Compromise of 1850, again engineered by Henry Clay, uh, the, who was uh, 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 properly referred to in history as the Great Compromiser. 
Henry Clay had died in 1860. Uh, There are some historians who asked if Henry Clay had still been alive, would he have been able to come up with another compromise that would at least have postponed the Civil War a bit longer or maybe stopped it entirely and that slavery would eventually have died out for economic reasons? We don't know. We just don't know. What I think is important is, or one of the things, is, is, is slavery was evil. And I think that will come out in, in, in the play. I mean, however you think it, it, it was best done away with, it was pure, unadulterated evil. Uh, the, uh, the very idea that one human being can own another human being, that's just appalling. And the way the world's history worked for how long? Oh, that is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah that that is exactly right. And and it wasn't always uh, racial. Right. I mean, there, uh, lots of times it was just uh, one country conquered another mm-hmm. and said, or one one group ethnic group con- conquered another and said, "Okay, we won. You're our slaves now." Right. That's it's how a, it worked. Yeah. Now the now the play is focused on uh, uh, John Brown. Uh, does it have dwell at all on the Civil War? And they either the cause of the Civil War or the effects of the Civil War. Well, it, it alludes to it because obviously in the play, the Civil War hasn't happened yeah. yet. Uh, and he, he has come to West Virginia to, to organize a slave army uh, that will set up a republic within the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, not all of its territory, but some of its territory. There, here's another question. He was tried for treason against the Commonwealth of Virginia. He was a citizen of the state of New York. How can you commit treason against a government of which you are not a citizen? See, back then, we weren't thought of as citizens of the United States. We were citizens of a particular state. And that is why the term war between the states was used a good bit. I was not aware of that. Oh, yeah. It's, it's the idea is it, uh, when we began as a nation, with the Articles of Confederation, it was clear it was 13 different countries entering into a voluntary uh, confederation, primarily for mutual defense. Over time, in fits and starts, we have grown more and more to we're one country. And, And the first big step in that direction was the United States Constitution, which incidentally was a cabal by George Washington and John Adams uh, and, 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 uh, and Alexander Hamilton and, and several other people to, who, who concluded that the Confederation wasn't going to work. We had to be one country, and they persuaded the Congress, uh, the continent, uh, uh, under the, uh, the, uh, uh, Confeder- the Articles of Confederation, to authorize a convention to amend those articles. And so they showed up and wrote an entirely new document, which basically was the beginning of the United States is, not the United States are. The Civil War was another step in the direction of more and more. We're one country and not several. Uh, And there have been other less critical steps along the way. But at the time, you remember Robert E. Lee said, I will not take up arms against Virginia. In his mind, Virginia was his country. Uh, and so uh, by, by, the, by the rules of then, he was not a traitor. By the rules of today, he, he was. Uh, just as George Washington would have been a traitor had we lost the American Revolution. That's true. <laughs> right. Hey, uh, John, before we run out of time on this segment, uh, yeah. when is the play? What time? What, how many shows? When, how do you get tickets? Uh, thank you for asking that question. Uh, and I was hoping. I was expecting you to ask yourself. Yeah, I was. Yeah. You were permitted to interview yourself in this segment. Well, uh, I was. It, we were all. I was having fun answering all that other stuff. So, um, got to put my glasses on here. Uh, the, uh, you can call 304 676 8059, or you can text. The date, name, and number of tickets to that number, 304-676-8059. Or you can email anviltickets at gmail.com. 
Tickets at gmail.com. Where is it being held again? In the courthouse in Charlestown. What date? And it is October 6th, 7th, and 8th, and October 13th, 14th, and 15th. Each case, Friday and Saturday at 8 p.m. Mm-hmm. Uh, the doors open at 7. And on Sundays, it's a, it's an, uh, an afternoon matinee, uh, which will begin at 2 p.m., and the doors uh, will, will open at 1. Tickets are $15 or $10 for anybody under 20 or over 60. Do you what? regard uh, John Brown as a sympathetic figure as he is portrayed in this play or not? Well, I, I wouldn't say he's necessarily portrayed as a sympathetic fi- figure uh, in this play. Uh, I think he's portrayed uh, as an enigma. And I think that's the way Julia Davis wrote the play, to, to, to have people come away saying, gee, I wonder about this guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Bill, final question. Yeah, uh, I'm fascinated with this. Thanks, John. Uh, the uh, the portrayal of John Brown. How consistent is that with other portrayals? Uh, the the first time this guy Robert Leonard basically portrayed him as superior to everybody around him. Uh, Joe plays him as actually quite vulnerable, uh, and and in in when you see in the play, he's uh, it, it, uh, halfway through. I'll, I'll I'll give away one thing about it, which of course is in the record. Uh, halfway through the play, he fires his lawyers because they don't. They're not conducting the trial like he thought they ought to conduct the trial, and he of course is not a lawyer. And uh, it, it's a. Uh, did, did he go into the trial anticipating that he's going to be found guilty? I think he did. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's a that's an image that has been uh, run through history. Yeah, I I, I think that's accurate. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a again. John, that's the way she wrote the play. How many people could uh, realistically fit in the room to see the play? I think about a hundred. Again, it is in the courtroom where they have trials. Yes. And yeah. So. All right. Very good. Uh, hey, thanks, man. That was pretty interesting. Well, you're welcome. That's and, a fascinating topic. And I've history. enjoyed being a co-host interviewing you <laughs> as a guest. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed it, too. Who, who, who wouldn't be? I mean, what the heck? <laughs>